So there's an article this this uh, quarter here in PES Wind Magazine about the company Bardex. So Bardex provides engineering solutions for offshore wind, including heavy lifting, installation, and operations. Now Bardex's past is much like a lot of the existing large companies coming into the offshore wind space is they've done a lot of stuff in oil and gas. So they know their way around ports. They know their way around shipyards. They know their they know key side operations. And when you read, this is an interesting one for everybody getting into offshore that's not been in there before. Key side is spelled Q-U-A-Y-S-I-D-E. So, so if you hear someone say key side, that's what they're that's what they're referring to. It took me like three years to figure that out when I got into oil and gas. Joel, it's not Quay. It's not Quayside. I've been doing it wrong all these years. So, so Bardex is in the in the magazine this month, and they're saying a lot of things that we've been talking about in the podcast for the last few years. So there's a knowledge that exists out in the world and in, you know, in the industrial world that can be transferred, right? So when you're talking offshore wind, a lot of the companies that are you know very good at it, the Demes and like Seaway Seven and some of these other ones doing large installs, they. St- got their start. They know their, how their operations, they know how to do heavy lifts offshore. They know how to do construction offshore because of oil and gas and the other project that they've been involved in. So Bardex is taking that same, those same uh, knowledge that they've built in how to make key port facilities, port and shipyard facilities and manufacturing facilities uh, optimized, right? Because there's a lot of people that um, you know, earlier off air, we were talking about building new port facilities over in California for some of this floating offshore wind. Well, the port facilities in California and on the East Coast of the United States, they're not ready for these things, right? They're not prepared. They're not those those port facilities are not built to have big jackets uh, manufactured there, welded up there, coated there, or loaded onto barges, or or if it's a you know floating offshore wind, so build it you know you're welding up facility or the the actual structures on land then you have to launch them and then you have to basically tug boat them out through you know what may be a shipping channel or something of this sort and those facilities and the people that are around them just aren't they're not used to it so bardex has got some some uh cool lifting technology and some other knowledge around consulting for making these facilities um you know, uh, lean manufacturing processes, standardizing how you do things, um, and and having simulation tools to put these things in place to make it easier to develop uh, offshore wind farms because that development doesn't ha- a lot of that development does not happen out at sea. That development happens on land, and then there's that transition to the ships or to being towed out, and then um, moored. Or if we're talking if we're talking floating wind, then it, then they have to be moored, anchored, all these other good things. Um, and those are ancillary uh, activities that you don't think about when you think about offshore wind. People think, okay, offshore wind, yeah, someone's building it. It's like when we talked about uh, Ridgeway rock bags. Like, what are rock bags? Why do we need these? Right? There's there's so many ancillary parts of this offshore wind play that people don't realize. Um, and Bardex is they're um, they're a really good resource uh, within that industry because. Or, or as this industry kicks off, because they've done it before, they know how to build keyside facilities and uh, make sure they're optimized to work. So, if you want to learn a little bit more about that, check them out. Uh, PES Wind Magazine for this quarter, uh, is, and is the company Bardex, B A R D E X. Staying on the offshore theme, the Port of Long Beach has unveiled a new massive four point seven billion dollars billion with a B offshore wind turbine assembly complex that will be known as Pier Wind. It'll it's going to be a 400 acre terminal built on newly dredged land, uh, where they can put these massive uh, wind turbines. That uh, now this all has to be developed and built and permitted, which is going to take obviously several years. Uh, it, they're it's so big that they're going to build like a 30 acre transportation corridor with four lanes, uh, so they, uh, they can get the trucks in and out to leave parts there. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a huge endeavor, uh, and they're, they're expecting to get some federal money to help with the cost of it. Uh, but we're talking about somewhere in 2027 when they're going to kick it off and hopefully it'd be done about four years later, 2031. This is a long term project and very complicated. And this is out in Phil's territory in California. Phil, obviously, there's a lot of players along that west coast of the U.S. that want to be involved in offshore wind. Long Beach, obviously, is a major port in the United States, period. It looks like they're trying to flex their muscles a little bit and just push everybody out of the port 
world um, for offshore wind? Potentially, yes. If if this thing actually goes through and gets built the way they're designing it, um, it will be. I mean, even though Humboldt is is going to happen um, with a, a different consortium, of course, uh, for the Northern California um, uh, lease areas that have already been uh, auctioned. Uh, Long Beach could end up serving certainly the Morro Bay sites and anything throughout um, the West Coast um, of of the U.S. and and theoretically even Mexico if they if they ended up um, you know ever doing anything down there. Um, now, as you said, they're going to have to dredge, and as anybody who lives in the Northeast knows about dredging, uh, it's not easy to get it environmentally permitted. This is a monstrous thing that has to be dredged, and I'm concerned that the, you know, the the kind of environmental powers that be out here in California may end up having to scale this back a bit. Um, so right now it's a four point seven billion dollar, you know, massive port. We'll see what we end up with by 2027, if that's even when they're going to be able to start. Um, I'm imagining people coming out of the woodwork to try and oppose it. Uh, certainly the shipping companies aren't going to be too happy because something that's this big taking up a chunk of space in the shipping lanes, um, you know, is, is not going to excite, uh, you know, the, the, the vessel operators and everything. Um, uh, but the good news for offshore wind is, again, if they can get this to happen, You know, this certainly serves the needs of, um, you know, the the offshore wind community, as we were talking about earlier, you know, with with the Vestas V236. I mean, if you're going to build factories, you need substantial acreage to be able to do this. This type of port facility will have the acreage to be able to accommodate that, um, you know, on-site manufacturing and quayside assembly. Uh, Notice I didn't say quayside. So <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, the reality with this is it's got a lot of potential. There have been some other um, proposals. There's a, a private uh, company that's trying to say, well, well, we should just install a temporary floating uh, dock uh, up near Morro Bay to be able to service that. Only the problem with that is, I mean, it's, conceptually, it's a good idea. The problem is that the people don't want it up there. They're they're like largely objecting to anything, even like the the um, service port that's going to have to be you know installed and upgraded in in Morro Bay, um, where it's at this point just kind of a, a small kind of fishing uh, you know town. Um, there's already a lot of locals that are interested in getting revenue associated with wind energy, but they don't want the infrastructure. Uh, anywhere in their backyard. So, you know, Port of Long Beach kind of solves that that issue. Um, so, I mean, all in all, I think if, if they can make this happen, it, it'll be great. Uh, again, I think the challenge with this is, are they going to be able to get everything that they want? Um, or is this going to end up having to be redesigned and scaled back a little bit based on the, envir- the environmental concerns? Um, that are likely to end up driving this the conversation about this port uh, extension and precisely where it goes, how big it is, etc. Uh, so one interesting thing there is, uh, like we we're talking about just a little bit ago with um, Bardex and, and their knowledge of how to build ports and things. If these are these floaters will come off of uh, out of this port of Long Beach, floaters are. They're going to be large. They're going to be massive structures that are going to be floated out. And when you pull those in a controlled area, such as the Port of Long Beach, normally you'll have three tugs on them. You'll have, you will either have one lead and two tails or two leads and one tail. So that's a operation. And then an operation also includes, uh, you know, sometimes there's patrol boats basically to keep everybody at, at bay and stuff. So the long port of long beach as well and i'm just thinking about this out loud is one of the most or probably the busiest port in north america because of all the all the goods that are coming into the united states from uh the apac region through there through that port so you're now now if you have that there now i'm not, i'm not saying this is as 
this is not a stop or anything. This is not even really probably a hurdle. But you're going to complicate a lot of the marine traffic around the port of Long Beach uh, by having this heat there. Because, I mean, I'm looking at the uh, marinetraffic.com, which tracks all the AIS system of all the large vessels in the world. And there's got to be 100 vessels already between Newport and Long Beach uh, sitting there as, I, as we're talking. Or more. So it's just another another wrinkle in the development of this. I think traffic on the ground is going to be even worse, right? The amount of truck traffic and especially moving big blades and big tower sections into that port is beyond what they typically do now, right? Which is mostly containers, which is pretty quick in and out. Moving big things in and out of there is going to be a problem. But again, most of that stuff would be either built on site or built in China, let's say, and then shipped over. So the the land-based infrastructure that they're talking about is really just trucking in raw materials, which you can usually do on flatbeds or, you know, cargo container sized stuff. So I mm, we'll see. This this is going to be a really good economic experiment right to figure out how to to keep the cost down and yet get these things made <laughs>